So welcome everybody. Um, this might be the last uh, talk for the spring uh, semester. Uh, so we're very happy to have uh, John Ding today. Um, uh, maybe before I continue, uh, maybe we should uh, in, uh, introduce the people here in the audience. So we have uh, Thomas Hollenstein, who is doing all the work behind the scene and making sure everything goes smoothly. So, uh, Hello. thank you, Thomas. Uh, maybe you want to uh, go around the table and introduce. Sure. Okay. So we we have on India here. So hi, on India. He's hey. joining from the IAS. Then we have Chandan Dubey here from a uh, group at ETH. We have a group at NYU from uh, Hawk Bennett. Let me unmute you. There you are. Say hi. We have um, K. Gopala Krishnan. Mm, the hello, but the, that doesn't seem to work so easy. And we have uh, Piyush Srivastane from UC Berkeley here. So, hello. Okay. And so that's it. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, Okay, so as I said, this might be the last uh, seminar for this semester. Uh, um, and uh, let me introduce the speaker. Um, so, John Ding, he graduated from Berkeley uh, in 2011 under the supervision of uh, Yuval Perez. And uh, now he's a professor at the University of Chicago. Um, uh, his uh, area of expertise is uh, uh, mixing times of uh, Markov chains, uh, probability, uh, more generally percolation theorems, uh, and so on. And today he'll tell us about uh, random uh, constraint satisfaction problems. Um, so feel free to interrupt uh, with any questions as usual. The microphones are muted, so you have to unmute before you ask a question. But um, other than that, you're all welcome to uh, to interrupt. Um, so, uh, John, please go ahead. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation and introduction. Uh, before the talk, I'm just a slight correction. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Chicago. Um, uh, this uh, certainly will be an interesting uh, experience. Though I, I, I'd like to point out that since I don't have an extra monitor, I could really, I could not actually see any of the audience. So unless you make a sound, I cannot realize that you are not happy about the talk. So if you, are, you want to ask something or not happy about something, uh, just say it out. I could not see you. Uh, anyway, so the entire talk uh, is based on joint work uh, with Alan Sly and Nike Sung. Uh, and the topic we're going to talk about is the constraint satisfaction problems. So basically, um, we are given a collection of uh, variables subject to constraints, and the, the object is to try to find a satisfying assignment. Um, These kind of problems are interesting for one of the reasons that a large subclass of these problems are canonical examples for NP-complete uh, uh, problems uh, algorithmic-wise. So since it is pretty difficult to try to solve the worst case of these problems, people uh, turned to ask, how about the hardness for average or typical case? This motivated to, uh, to the study of random constraint satisfaction problems. Before moving, before, move on, uh, before moving on the talk, let me give you one example of a constraint satisfaction satisfaction problems. Probably the most uh, uh, prominent one, which is the Boolean satisfiability. So, okay, let's say we fix a number k, say k is 3. So we look at a, a bunch of c and f of this form that shows up in the slides, uh, x1 or x2 or negative or of x3, things of this kind. We have a bunch of them. Your job is to try to find a, 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 a Boolean assignment that satisfies all these clauses, all these uh, 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 x1 or x2 or negative x3 forms of this kind simultaneously. Uh, in random CSP, the idea is to sample uniformly from the space of uh, uh, n variable m clauses formulas. So, uh, 
a, a one natural way to do the random sampling is you can just sample uh, uh, without replacement uniformly. Sorry, with replacement uniformly. I guess both are okay. Uh, so th this is uh, one of the examples for CSP. In these constraint satisfaction problems, one parameter is uh, uh, of particularly of particular importance. That is the constraint parameter, which is in the example of uh, uh, Boolean satisfiability. It's just the ratio between the number of uh, clauses, the number of formulas you want to satisfy, uh, and the number of variables you have. So we denote, we denote this number by alpha. There, are, there were a number of empirical studies uh, in early 90s, and they discovered that there is sort of a phase transition in terms of uh, satisfiability uh, of random set problems. The, this plot is about three sets, so basically by phase transition, I mean the following. For any fixed k, there is a fixed number alpha depending only on k such that in the limit of n, when the ratio between, uh, when the constraint parameter, the ratio between the uh, number of clauses and the number of variables change slightly below this fixed uh, alpha to slightly above this uh, fixed alpha, the probability for whether this uh, random uh, set instance can be satisfied change, uh, changing drastically from close to 1 to close to 0, as shown in this picture. What is, in, OK, in the picture in the left, uh, in the left-hand side regime is under constraint, so the probability of uh, satisfiability is close to one. In the right-hand side, there are too many constraints, so the uh, 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 probability for satisfiability uh, is close to zero. What is also interesting is it seems the hardness for the algorithmic perspective of these problems seem to also uh, correlated with this uh, phase transition of uh, satisfiability. Uh, more precisely, empirical evidence on, on a backtracking, DPLL backtracking algorithm to trying to search for a uh, 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 satisfied assignment also undergoes a similar transition in this transition, uh, it, it, the, empirically, the, the complexity for this algorithm is highest uh, around, the, uh, around the satisfiability threshold. It's, in some sense, sort of intuitive, even though I don't think there is a really good understanding. Way before the threshold, satisfiability threshold, the the random set instance should be relatively easier to satisfy, so it should be easier to actually find assignment. Way, way uh, after the uh, uh, transition threshold, it is very difficult to satisfy the, uh, all these formulas, so it may be easier to actually uh, give a certificate that there is no such uh, assignment. The, the best rigorous uh, algorithm up to date, uh, to my best knowledge, is due to Amin Koja Okalan in 2010. Uh, this, he designed some sort of local search algorithm, which, which is proved to be efficient uh, up to when the uh, constraint parameter is close to 2 to the k times log k over k. But in any case, OK, let me just uh, point out this 2 to the k times log k over k, it's still far away from the uh, satisfiability threshold, predictions of that. And it, it seems understanding the set, unset, the satisfiability transition uh, seems to be a precursor to address the complexity issue here for the 
uh, for the random instance of the problems. So that's one of the motivations for uh, for studying these uh, random CSV problems. So John, just to make sure I understand, this is all that. So um, yes, above the threshold, this formula is almost surely unsatisfiable. So what does the algorithm actually do there? You you need to return basically say no, you can't you can't find the algorithm. It's I mean, certificate. You, you pretend the algorithm doesn't actually know uh, the the density ratio and try to try to search for a formula. And when it cannot succeed, when it exhausts basically the whole such space, it would, would return a no. I see. Thanks. So the DPLL is basically a, you can imagine the search space has a tree structure because when you assign a, a partial, when you give a partial assignment and you try to decide whether you can complete the, uh, the rest to get a satisfiable uh, assignment. So if you have way more formulas, then I imagine you don't have to go that deep in the in the tree to decide it's not it, this branch is not going to work. I see. Thanks. I have a question. Thank you. Yeah, yes. So is the threshold known in terms of k and n? Uh, very good question. The threshold is only depends on n. It's in the limit. Sorry, the threshold conjecturally only depends on k and it should converge when n goes to infinite, but it's not known. There are predi very precise predictions. Numerically, we know. We know it rather precisely, but rigorously, OK. Rigorously, it's also known uh, up to very good precision for SET. That's the uh, very recent work of Amin Koja Okerlan. The up and the lower bound uh, differ by amount that shrink in terms of k. But still, there's a gap if, if k is fixed. So depending on your sense of no, that the answer is yes or no. Okay, thanks. So, so we don't, the bottom line, we don't know the, we do not know the location of the phase transition precisely, and that's the, I think that's the major problem here. Okay. Is that fine? Yes, it's fine. Okay, good. So that's the algorithmic perspective is uh, one main part of the motivation, but there's another side of the picture here. The physicists have taken have, have taken a uh, different approach to study these uh, uh, random CSPs. They basically put these uh, problems into the framework of statistical mechanics and studied them as models of uh, disordered systems. And this this kind of studies have developed into a very rich theory, and it yield, yielded remarkably precise mathematical predictions. Uh, though mathematically these this very inspiring methods uh, adopted by physicists are not rigorous. So it, had, so it was a major challenge to try to establish a uh, rigorous ma math mathematical theory here to, to verify the physic, physic, physics prediction. Not many, not much has been known. There were a number of uh, landmark papers, uh, mathematical-wise, including uh, Ados's uh, zeta-2 limit for random assignment problem and uh, Telegram's uh, proof for Parisi formula for SK spin glass models. In the setting for when the graph is sparse, which is what we are talking about, if you uh, recall the constraint ratio alpha is like a, is of a constant uh, magnitude. That's m over n. So that's a sparse graph setting. Basically, not much is known in this uh, in this case, uh, and that's the and that's the class of models that we are going to uh, discuss in the rest of the talk. And indeed, let me show you this. Uh, very intriguing and also elusive uh, uh, phase transition pictures that these non-rigorous methods laid out. Uh, in this phase diagram, there are five pictures. The, the, the black dots uh, represent uh, solutions to the constraint satisfaction problems. The most interesting regime is the picture three and the picture four. As you can see, uh, the solutions are 
clustered with each other in these two pictures, especially in picture four, the clustering is pretty heavy. You can see kind of visually the largest uh, cluster here seems to be dominating, uh, but the other guides are also contributing. So in the later talk, the third picture I may refer to shattering regime and the fourth picture I may refer to condensation regime. I will come back to this picture later. And this kind of picture, this kind of, the phase transitions described in this picture covers a number of interesting models, uh, including a set when k is larger than 3, an independent set, coloring, and a max cut. Maybe let me give you uh, one more remark. When k equal to 3 for set, the picture is slightly different uh, in the sense that picture 3 disappeared. But OK, in the, in the rest of the talk, we were many folks on the case when k is very large, but fixed. So here are some previous rigorous work for sparse constraint satisfaction problems with no replica symmetric breaking uh, kicking in. So for, those mo for these models, a exact phase transition have been determined for a number of pro problems, including two set, uh, y in k set, and k XOR set. Well, y in k set is just a restricted version of set, meaning in every clause, precisely one of them is one. Uh, k XOR set is basically you can view it as a uh, uh, just a linear equations on the field on Boolean on Boolean numbers on zero and one. So, in some sense, since the this, these problems do not ex exhibit a RSB. Uh, the proofs are relatively easier, but only relatively. It's still a huge amount of effort uh, to, to actually pin down the, 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 the precise location for transition, even for these models. There uh, is I even a, a uh, yes. I have a question. What is replica symmetry breaking? Yeah. The, I will explain that a bit more in the rest of the talk, but for now, maybe one way to understand, there are, okay, there are many ways to understand it. For now, just say, directly counting the number of solutions and use the second moment method, it would fail, meaning the second moment would be much larger than the first moment square. Does that so make it, sense? So is yeah. it like a property of the proof or a property of the CSP? It's a property of the model. Oh, okay. And that, Okay. I mean, you just do the, you just count what's the number of the solutions. Mm. That's a random number. You can compute the first moment and second moment. If the second moment is way larger than the first moment, that, that's the, you can take that as a definition of ISP. Basically, that means the clustering is so heavy such that uh, it, it contributes a lot to the, uh, to the second moment. Sure. Okay, maybe another way to say it is, in the picture four, you can see if I want to compute the first moment, I have to take into account all these uh, clusters. The RSP basically would mean the cluster that would contribute most to the first moment only appear with exponentially small probability. So essentially, what, what matters more for the first moment are things that don't, don't show up, basically. That's another. Another way to say the second moment is going to blow up. We will come back to discuss a bit more of this uh, RSP regime and the properties. Uh, so we will have a chance to look, to re visit, revisit it. Thanks. OK. Uh, so there are, for CSPs with RSB, there were also a, well, a very long list of uh, previous works. And uh, for independent set, coloring, or not, a, not all equal set, and a set, uh, I think I have mentioned already in the very recent work of Koja Okerlund, 
he obtained uh, a pretty good band on the location for the phase transition, but still, in all these uh, previous works, a gap remains uh, in all these models. So there is so far uh, no work of this, no previous work can uh, really de determine the existence of a threshold. Also, let me mention two other works which are more abstract and do not work on uh, specific models per se, but take a more general approach. Uh, in the celebrated work of Freegood, he proved, among other things, the existence of threshold sequence for set. Though his proof does not, the, the threshold sequence could depend on n, it does not necessarily converge uh, uh, as n goes to the infinite, which is something we want also here. Which is also which is something that included in the physics predictions. Also, there is another very nice work of uh, Bayati, Gamanik, and Tatali. They use some sort of uh, interpolation uh, method to show for a large number of uh, random CSPs the existence of the sharp threshold. And in their work, they actually show the uh, the, the limit exists, though, let me give two more remarks. First, their method is not model, de model dependent, so they could not give the e explicit location for where the uh, phase transition occurs. Second, uh, their work could not really, deter could not really say the existence of, existence of threshold for, for set, for satisfiability. But they can say that the density of uh, uh, max set or, or the density of uh, largest uh, independent set exist. So does not, it does not cover the satisfiability threshold for set, though. So those are the, those are, these are the uh, previous works. We say these uh, classes of uh, CSPs are uh, RSB, but the good news is many of them can be described by one RSB. Okay, intuitively, RSB basically tells you something is bad. You have a clustering structure of the solutions. One RSB is telling you that, well, things are bad, but not too bad. You have the clustering structure, but the clustering structure is not too complicated. It's, it's a sort of one level. So this kind of heuristics allowed physicists, well, Mazad and the Parisi here, to develop uh, a very nice method, the Cavett method, including particularly belief propagation and survey propagation, so they can uh, make exact predictions about the location of, uh, of the trans uh, phase transition. Hold on. And, and in this talk, uh, we give the first uh, rigorous verification for this uh, one RSB prediction uh, for the satisfiability, satisfiability transition. Uh, these two models are not all equal set. It's a symmetrized version of set. It's, it's easier to study than set. Uh, and also independent set. Both works are on regular random graphs with uh, large but fixed degree. Let's now come back to Boolean satisfiability. Just to make sure, so regular you mean yes. each variable is uh, appears in the same number of uh, exactly. questions? Exactly. Each okay. variable appears. Well, for, for, for independent set, you're looking at the graph anyway, so that's just right. a random regular graph. Uh, for the not all equal set, it just means exactly as you, what you said. Each variable appears, or each literal appears, if that more, more precisely, a uh, fixed number of times. So that's now cool. let's... Uh, Let's look more closer of uh, Boolean satisfiability. There are a number of uh, ways that you can do the sampling. I guess the most natural one corresponds to the adosh rand Adosh graph sampling. So it's just the uniform measure of all uh, n variable m clause uh, 
uh, saying Fs. The slightly different uh, instance is the random regular graph case, which as uh, just suggested is each variable would uh, appear in a fixed number of uh, uh, times. And the constraint parameter, just as a reminder, is again the ratio between number of clauses and number of variables. Uh, and uh, this has been a basically a benchmark problem. I guess I don't have to emphasize too much for this bit. OK. So record that I said there is this uh, Algorithm by Amin Koja Akhelen, which works up to uh, some number, which is 2 to the k times log k over k. But the threshold is believed to occur, it actually should occur around the number uh, 2 to the k times log 2. So there is a huge gap between what an algorithm can do and what and, and the existence of a satisfied, satisfied assignment. And the later improvement are uh, using non-algorithmic analysis. The first one actually is done uh, by Archileoptes and more uh, in 2002 via studying a symmetrized version. They're not all equal set of set. So let me remind you what is a not all equal set. So basically, in order to satisfy a clause, both, both the assignment and the negative of the assignment has to satisfy it in, in set. In other words, in the clause, you have to have both 1 and 0 to, in order to satisfy it. So this removes the asymmetry uh, 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 in, the, in the set model, so make the problem easier, though, though it is harder to satisfy not all equal set by definition, well, which is also why a lower bound on not all equal set can be automatically a lower bound on, on set. And they they should basically be, behave qualitatively that have the same phenomenon. Uh, I think the up to date uh, previous work on not all equal set is also is, is due to Koja Okelan and the Pana Gyoto. But again, in these works, there is a gap. So here comes our result. Uh, we prove that for random regular k not all equal set problem, uh, k large enough but fixed, there is a sharp transition at a explicit threshold alpha star depending on k for which we can determine explicitly. Let me also say in a simultaneous work, ACO considered a different uh, symmetrization of a random regular k set and established a sort of one RSB formula for not exactly satisfiability threshold, but a quasi satisfiability threshold. Now let me tell you a little bit about uh, the background and what and our result uh, on independent sets. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yes. Uh, what was the difference between the result you just stated and the previous things you covered? Say Can that again. What is the difference between the result you just stated and the uh, result on the previous slides? There is no gap. Oh, we can determine if we. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 There's, oh, there's no gap. But, so, well, independent set is basically what well, I give you a graph, and you look at a subset such that uh, uh, there in the subset you don't have a, a a two vertices that are neighboring to each other in the graph. The constraint parameter here uh, we, we should be interpreted as the density of the independent set, meaning the uh, num the, the size of the independent set normalized by the size of the graph. And the uh, satisfiability transition uh, is quite 
corresponds to the max max density or independence ratio. Algorithmic wise, the independence ratio is an MP hard problem to compute. And it's even hard to approximate. And even on bounded degree graphs, this is due to the progress of PCP theorem. And if we look at the randomized problem, we can look at random graphs. And in this talk, we, we've, in our work, we look at random regular graphs with a large degree. And we let AN to be the size of the largest uh, independent set in random graph GN. And we ask the question, uh, what can you say about the asymptotics for AN? The, the sharpness of the uh, satisfiability transition is corresponding to the uh, tight concentration for the random variables a n here. So let me just give you a bunch of uh, graphing examples of interest. I think this is a this is a dense graph at the Shrani. This is a sparse at the Shrani graph. And this is a sparse regular random graph. Uh, there is also a huge number of uh, previous works on independent sets. I think it was a quite interesting problem uh, in combinatorics, in probabilistic combinatoric, probabilistic combinatoric community. Uh, the dense case is much easier in this case. For the sparse case, there is a also a list of literature devoting to this problem, but again. They determined that the threshold should be around 2 log d over d, but there's a gap between the low and upper bound here. Also, for this problem, uh, I don't know, uh, the, 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 there is a classical argument using Dube's martingale. Uh, you can easily show that the, the, size of, the size of an has a fluctuation bounded by root 10. That was a that was a really soft argument. Also, by the work I mentioned before uh, of uh, Bayati, Gamanik, and Tatali, uh, the limit intensity exists. So the alpha star exists in the limit is known. Uh, our contribution is to A, determine alpha star explicitly. And also, we decide, actually, there is a log n correction term. And the largest size, largest size a n, is very concentrated around this explicitly uh, value we gave. How how much concentrated? Well, we can prove that the fluctuation is of order one. Again, this result is assuming the degree d is large enough. Okay, maybe I should remark that in our works, we did not try to optimize the d zero, what is the lower bound of d zero, because we don't quite think. Uh, the effort we are, the effort required to optimize it uh, is worth it since we it seems we will not be able to present a decent number anyway so we didn't even try to optimize it d0 is pretty large uh, let me just uh, give you an idea how explicit the alpha star can be uh, I'm not really expecting you to read these formulas, but just uh, take a, taking a glance and having having some sense that this can be given by formulas of this kind. It's not the the most uh, ideal thing you would wish, but it's certainly not 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 too bad. It's just some. I mean, it can be described explicitly by these formulas. It's not not very complicated. And as, as I have said, all these predictions have been made by physicists, and our work uh, verified that the physicists are correct. The, the predictions are, are driven, were driven by uh, the so-called survey propagation. It's a particular version of the 1RSB cavity method. So we basically give some validation of this method uh, rigorously. 
Now let me uh, tell you a bit more what is a uh, replica symmetric breaking and why it makes uh, locating the threshold uh, difficult. Well, in order to understand this, maybe we start dreaming how we can actually locate the threshold. Well, how, we, how should we start? Very naturally, uh, the, 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 the satisfiability transition just corresponds to the positivity of the number of uh, solutions that you have, which is, we can say this is a random variable depending on the uh, instance you sampled. In order to prove the upper bound, in order to show that no such solution exists, a very natural ways to compute expectation, and if the expectation uh, goes to the zero, then we, we would be very happy to say no such, ex uh, no such solution can exist with good probability. The lower bound is a bit more troublesome, since the algorithmic approach runs into barriers way earlier before the, uh, way ahead of the uh, uh, true threshold, we have to seek for some non-constructive uh, approach, and a, a very natural candidate is the second moment method, which is basically a uh, special case of cautious bias inequality. You compute the first moment of this random variable, and you compute the second moment of this random variable. If you are lucky that the first moment square is comparable to the second moment, you can conclude that the the you, you can conclude that with a good with, with a positive probability, uh, the the the, the, the solution exists, and then combine with, uh, well, depending on which graph you are working with, if in, in the Adashirani graph case, you can use free goods result to automatically uh, enhance the probability to one. Uh, in our case, unfortunately, you have to, we have to do extra work in order to make the probability from positive to one, because uh, free goods result does not apply to random regular graph case. But let's focus on when the second moment will be uh, comparable to the first moment square. That's like the number one difficulty here. We can imagine, in order to compute the second moment, basically we need to sum over the, all the pairs and compute the probability for both solutions, sigma and tau, are satisfiable. You can imagine if two assignments, sigma and tau, are very close to each other, then they should be this they should be very correlated the the joint probability for both of them to be satisfied should be basically determined by one of the copies and this kind of correlation uh, could contribute a lot to the to the second moment and 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 and, and thereby uh, leading to the failure of second moment method most likely occur before if the first moment is just the very close to one. More precisely, let's say, uh, let's let's imagine we have a we have a random uh, instance of the set problem or not all equal set problem. Then we assign a typical solution. Then typically, so let's say we condition on this is a uh, satisfiable solution. Typically, there will be a linear number of uh, variables such that we don't have any constraint on these variables, meaning flipping these variables from 1 to 0 or 0 to 1 doesn't really matter. The formula is still satisfied. So this kind of means as long as you have one solution, you should have an exponentially exponential size of uh, solutions in that cluster because you have a linear number of uh, variables that is uh, free to this kind of flipping. And this would contribute to the second moment by first moment times the, the, this kind of size of the cluster. And if the size of the cluster is larger than the first moment, uh, the second moment blows up in this case. And this could be seen as one of the definition uh, for replica symmetry breaking. And it does happen in, it, and this does occur in the following models. The sad, independent sad, coloring, and the max cut. So there's a, this non trivial gap due to this. From a physics uh, perspective, let's recall the uh, phase diagram laid out by 
by the, by this uh, physics work before. We focus on the regime. Well, okay. When we increase the constraint parameter, uh, if the if the, if alpha is too large, well, then no solution exists. If alpha is small, then the solutions are either very well connected or there's a very giant, large giant component connected dominates the whole solution space. Those are so relatively easy scenarios. What's get more interesting is when alpha is larger than some certain alpha d, uh, the, the, the solutions breaking into a number of clusters. When it gets uh, uh, even larger, the cluster, the clustering uh, uh, exhibit a, a, a different, a qualitatively, qualitatively different uh, picture. If we compare picture three and the picture four in this diagram, in picture three, in both of them we have a large number of clusters, but in picture three, every cluster only counts a small fraction of the total number of solutions, as opposed to in in diagram in, in picture four, uh, you have a lot of uh, clusters, but the first the largest, uh, say the first hundred uh, clusters, basically dominates, basically contains uh, uh, ninety nine percent of the of the of the total number of solutions here. Uh, also, another way to understand RSP is we, now we focus on the regime regime four. If we fix the uh, if we fix the instance of the problem and sample two uniform uh, legitimate solutions and look at the how look at the behavior of the correlation. If there is no RSB, then the solutions uniformly sampled should look basically independent with each other. If there is an RSB, then their correlation should be positive, could be positive. That's another way to understand uh, RSB. But in any case, the bottom line is with the presence of RSB, uh, the 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 the, contribu the, the contribution, dominating contribution to the first moment, I think I mentioned this before also, comes from the super large clusters uh, that on average basically do not show up at all. So all of these uh, coincide with each other and resulted in the failure of uh, a direct second moment method. Well, the, this, uh, whether it's a, Without RSP, we say it's, then it's a replica symmetric. Or with RSP, there's another uh, difference which, which kind of determine whether a certain technique would work or not. Without RSP, uh, if we look at vertices, two vertices in the graph, typically they should basically look, there's no correlation. Because of this, we look at a fixed vertex and look at the uh, a bounded neighborhood around it, and if we uh, we can we, we can try to understand uh, the measures on this tree. Uh, if there is no correlation in the graph, that basically means in the cavity graph that we just removed, those vertices on the boundary of this uh, neighborhood should behave independently, which means we can approximate the measure. We can approximate the measure by uh, uh, a regular tree. And this is kind of the belief propagation heuristic. In the case there is a uh, RSB, things are much more complicated. Well, maybe I will, let's say I will, I, I will just uh, skip this two RSB discussion. We focus on one RSB. That means the, there is a clustering structure of the solution. But, the, but it's only one level. Uh, hold on. So in this case, in this case, well, since we have a class one level clustering structure for the solutions, if we do not look at the solutions itself, but look at the cluster of solutions, then we should go back to the replica symmetric uh, case 
and the kind of the moment method should succeed there. Meaning, the key is we should change the object we are counting. We do not count the number of solutions directly. Uh, instead, we count the number of cluster of solutions we have. And the, since the original model has a one SB structure, which means the solutions have one level cluster. That means if you look at the cluster, there's no clustering anymore. If the RSB structure is more complicated, then this would not work. But if it's indeed in the one SB case, which, which is the case for uh, not equal set and independent set, for, at least for large K, uh, this, can, this, this should work. So, so basically, that's how uh, our work uh, 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 approaches this kind of computation. Previous attempts by Koja Okelan and Pena Gyoto and some later works of uh, Koja Okelan also uh, attack the problem along this line, but the, 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 uh, the implement of this, uh, this suggestion relied on a not exact uh, definition for clusters. Uh, I will maybe I, I will have a chance to explain what is the difference for our definition of a cluster and their definition of a cluster in a moment. But our the main novelty of our approach is to uh, study a simple combinatorial model for clusters uh, for these models. And John, are, are you still going to use some kind of second moment method, saying yes, that yes, okay. yes, yes, so we, we count the the number of clusters, and we use first and the second moment method to do the computation. It's just we change the object we're we're going to count. I see. So because you're saying a non um, a non-zero number of clusters is still, I mean, it still gives you uh, satisfiability. That's what we care about. Right. Right. I mean, exactly. Right, and just to make sure, so you're saying what goes wrong in the second moment method is if your uh, random variable is not concentrated, then you cannot hope to get bounds close to one. Is that the thing? Uh, you mean the the probability? Yeah, okay. You you really can just hope to show the second moment is bounded by first moment square, but there's a constant, right? So you can show the probability is positive, but but not necessarily close to one. Right. So how do you get close to one? For that, you need uh, z, your random variable, to essentially be constant, right? That that is not a exactly trivial issue. So if you can recall what has been done before, in maybe you you're, you're familiar with the Hamiltonian uh, path for for random regular graph. A direct computation can give you a positive probability, but in order to get with the probability close to one, uh, you really have to do substantially more work. And what's done there is a, a, a by a subgraph conditioning method because the number of short cycles influence the uh, mm -hmm. variance of the of the number of Hamiltonian cycles. But you have Friedgood's theorem, so you know there's a sharp threshold, right? So right, right. Hold, yes, you have oh, okay. Friedgood's theorem for a Dirac graph. But you don't have that for a regular random graph. So oh. for a Dirac graph, as long as you can say the probability is larger than 0.1, you are done. Right. But for random regular graph, that's why I use the comparison with the Hamiltonian cycle. That's also what's what's been done there. Uh, it really the the Frigo's method, the Frigo's work just does not apply. Uh, mm. It is not directly or easily. So you have to do more work. We took a different approach, uh, which is kind of it's along the same lines of intuition that the short cycles, the number of short cycles matter uh, to, the, to this fluctuation of the uh, number of uh, clusters. But we do not exactly do subgraph conditioning. Uh, uh, instead, we, uh, we, we, we did some sort of Fourier uh, uh, transform calculation there. Mm. I'm, well, I'm not sure I, we want to jump into a okay, thanks. discussion there. But there is some serious uh, problem. and. It's done uh, using sort of free method, and the and the intuition is basically the number of uh, short cycles influence the variance, and we sh you should somehow take into the influence of, of those things. Thanks. Okay, uh, how much time I have? I, I thought I have 15 minutes, or I can actually go uh, f go for a few more minutes because I. I was a bit slow here I today. Mean, we usually have an hour, and people sometimes go over time. So okay. you can so definitely I, take, uh, yeah. Let, let me continue for a little okay. bit then. Thanks. Great.
So the, now let's try to imagine what should be the definition of the cluster. We sort of have the idea, basically. In the set, you basically have the variables that you can flip around. Those things should kind of correspond to a cluster. But more rigorously, let's imagine an independent set. So, so now suppose you have a, actually a set which is an independent set. Let zero means unoccupied, one means occupied. So typically there will be a linear number of zeros such that is only close to one ones, right? So you suppose the ones are random, you have a deep neighbors, there's some chance that you only have one ones around it. If that's the case, you have a zero, you have a one, they are they are connected to each other, and there are no other neighboring ones around it. So you are allowed to swap this zero and the ones, right? And it's again an independent set of the same size. And you can actually do this as long as you have a zero and the ones such that there are no other neighboring ones. The, the previous method basically defined a cluster in the way by taking into account this one step swap. But what would really happen is if you allow one pair of zero and ones that you, you, can, you can swap, so basically you mean this pair is free, now we should set them to be free variables. This would, this would allow you to, to swap other zero and one pairs which you could not swap before. So there is this kind of uh, chain effect uh, uh, showing up in this kind of procedure and can, can, can be defined in this sort of coarsening uh, projection. So you basically relabel these neighboring zero ones that you can swap, swap by freeze, and this may result in further zero and ones that you can swap. You label them as freeze, and you continue doing so. Of course, you would worry, if what if this procedure does not end? The good news is, uh, close, to the, uh, uh, close to the independence ratio, uh, this kind of... Uh, 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 chain effect should just be a subcritical branching process, so so it should stop pretty quickly, actually. Let me show you the picture which sort of describes how the coarsening procedure goes. You take an independent set, you find some sort of pairs that you can swap. This may uh, further allow you to swap more pairs. I guess this is another uh, animation that shows this uh, kind of procedure. I don't have enough time, so I will just run quick here. OK, and let me also remark that this kind of coarsening procedure appeared already in previous works. And even this kind of, this kind of uh, definition of cluster was also implicitly uh, suggested in previous works. Now, the key observation is that due to this coarsening procedure, this kind of configuration gives us essentially uh, a, a graphical model. So we can work on this model. This model is essentially uh, a, 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 well, essentially a factor model on clusters. And now we just try to do the counting for this model, and we work on this model. By doing so, since now we Define the new model, which uh, where each configuration corresponds to one cluster in the original model. We go from one RSB back to a replica symmetric. So now the second moment method, if the physics heuristics is in, indeed valid, uh, the second moment of this uh, number of clusters should be bounded by the up to constant by the first moment square uh, of the number of clusters. And then we can use uh, uh, we can use the uh, uh, this kind of moment method to, to, to show the existence of the solutions. The talk, well, I basically just give an overview picture of what's going on. There are a lot of technical work that is required to actually prove uh, the, the second moment can be bounded. Do I have three minutes to just quickly explain yeah, definitely, uh, some of the things there? Definitely. OK. So, Basically, now we are looking at this model on the clusters. We want to show the second moment is bounded by the first moment. A key issue is to determine 
in the partition function, in the expectation of the partition function, what is the maximizer of the empirical measure, uh, empirical measure on this kind of zero, one, three things uh, that contributes most to the partition function, both in the single copied model or also and also in the pairwise model, since we also want to control the second moment. So this is going to be a optimization problem in the very large dimensions. We have to use some sort of symmetry to reduce the dimension. That's kind of one step. And then we have to use some sort of, I think this is a previous work of uh, uh, Amir Dambo, Andrew Martinari, Ellen and Nike. They can connect this kind of maximizer uh, with the fixed point equation, sort of a belief uh, with a PP equation. Uh, you solve a fixed point equation, this should give you the maximizer. However, it does not directly give you a maximizer to give you the stationary point. And, you, and we are not very lucky. The stationary point is not unique. So we are dealing with a number of uh, fixed points. And we have to determine the correct one is the maximizer. So another big chunk of hard analysis goes to combinatorial a priori estimates trying to rule out, trying to basically nail down a small region to say that the maximize has to occur in this region. And we can find one fixed point in this region, so the maximize is there. It's this kind of a priori estimates is not entirely just a sweat. It requires actually a bit. Well, I don't know. It's not. It's not that trivial. So with all this work, we can hopefully now determine the second moment is bounded by the first moment square, and then there is this work to. This work required to get from positive probability to pro probability one, because the free good does not apply to regular graph case. We use this. Uh, we build a sort of martingale and combined with a Fourier calculation uh, for for not all equal set, especially for independent set. Since we decided to be ambitious to try to nail down the precise fluctuation, which is of order one, uh, that required some even more extra effort on the top of uh, what we did uh, for not all equal set. Um, I guess if you are interested in some of the techniques, our stock version of the paper kind of surveyed this uh, proof outline in a high level, but more detailed than the talk I gave. But it's, it's, it's um, in a high level in the sense you don't see many dirty work, but still give I, I hope some idea on how mathematics are actually carried out in for 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 these models. Uh, that that could be a good source, in my opinion. The real paper would look uh, a bit dense. So I guess that's all that I want to say. Uh, thanks for for your attention. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, so. Uh, let me start with uh, um, asking if there are any any questions, any more questions. And India, uh, so maybe ask one question. So uh, it seems like uh, working with the Erdős Schrödinger model is actually much easier. Um, so uh, uh, what what do you gain by not by using regular? Why do, why doesn't the result also hold for Erdős Actually. You may have the impression that working on Adash Rani is easier because you have free goods result. Right. That, that makes it a bit easier, but it's actually much harder, I think. Uh, in Adash Rani graph, the local neighborhood has fluctuations. It's not homogeneous. Right. For the regular random graph, local needs just look like a re regular tree. Mm -hmm. And this oh. kind of fluctuation really makes things bad. For example, let me just say the degrees in Adash Rani graph can fluctuate, right? So with some very small probability, you could have a degree that is much smaller, a degree sequence that is much smaller than what it should be. But if, the degree, just, yeah. if the degree is small, that means the number of clauses is smaller now. That means you should have, in principle, you should have a, large, a much larger number of uh, solutions. This could mean. The, if you ca compute the expectation of the number of solutions, even if you compute in the cluster sense, uh, the, the contribution to the first moment could come from this extremely unlikely event to produce a graph with low degrees. Then the second moment would blow up in this case. Mm. What 
I mean, Toja Ackland did is to conditioning on the uh, degree sequence and then do the computation. But things are really more complicated. Well, that's why he can got a rather rather good estimate. But things are more complicated. Even if you, uh, even if you conditioning on the degree sequence, the kind of ways how they are connected to each other, there's also randomness there, and they can really influence the uh, 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 the, the number of uh, solutions you have. I mean. Why, if the large degree vertex connect to not large degree vertex, or large degree vertex can connect to a small degree vertex, that would create this kind of fluctuation, which is really a curse here. Uh, seems to be, I think it's a conceptual difficulty. It seems like that. But you would guess that the same threshold should hold, uh, I imagine, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, sh- okay. I'm not sure how, what do you mean by the same, how precise you want this. Right. Right. Similar, they should be very similar. Mm. But the, in the regular case, well, since all the degrees are the same, all the label, local neighborhood look like the same, so it makes it easier to handle the calculation for the, for, 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 for the moment. Yes. Did I answer your question? Hello? Thanks, yeah, this is very clear. So maybe ask one more thing. Uh, sure. Just to understand the last part of the proof. So you're saying basically you have a definition of a cluster, and the definition is good in a sense that the number of clusters is uh, rather stable, rather um, concentrated, right? Uh, that's what you're basically showing? Right. Basically, basically, what I'm trying to say is you start with a 1RSB model, meaning the solutions have a clustering structure. Mm-hmm. We define a cluster model. Now it's not a zero one value. That they will also introduce a free variable, meaning this kind of variable you can flip. This kind of one zero free model is on, is itself a uh, well, let's be kind of sketchy. It's a, it's itself a factor model. This kind of model is a actually is a replica symmetric because now we are looking at the uh, clusters. That's why the second moment can work. Of course, one has to define a good model here, but. Th- yeah. Right. And this is based on the local moves that you described. Right, right. Okay. Because the, the way you have clustering is because look at this two zero and ones, you can swap these two things. So this is not rigid, they should be set to free. And this now this one has been set to free, maybe there are neighboring ones now can be, or neighboring zeros and, and other ones can you can swap. So you just continue doing so. Uh, this. This gives you basically a map from a solution to a cluster, right? Uh, I, th- I have one question. But if you forget about the oh. procedure you did, look, just look at what would be the final, uh, this kind of 0, 1, F uh, configuration. When the procedure stops, it naturally gives you a, a, a cluster model to work with. So, so can I understand this, that you're saying, yeah, kind of two two independent sets are in the same cluster if once you go to this other picture they they give you the same I don't know how you call this this independent set together with these free edges say that again I, I'm not sure I quite understand your question so, sorry so are you are you kind of saying that two independent sets are in the same cluster of independent sets if when you have like these free edges Right, right, right. Yes, okay. yes, exactly. Okay, and then you just count the clusters. I see. Yes, I just, I just treat the all this uh, independent set configuration as one. Yes. And I just count this as one cluster. Uh, I have a question. So uh, you said that for the independent set case, there was already like the transition that there was a transition. It was known. All that There's was a... not known was the uh, transition probability. Is that correct? Okay, for independent set, what's known is that we know there's a limited density for the max independent set. That was, the limit exists is known by the work of Beati, uh, Gamanik, and Tatali. But what's not known is okay. the explicit the value of this limit. Uh, no, so, uh, so just coming to this point, it, uh, f- uh, the reason, one of the reasons which made this part, I mean, as you said, it's not that if you switch to the Shrani model, everything becomes, uh, things become easier. But uh, you couldn't use the feed good result because even if there was a positive probability of a, uh, like z being greater than zero, it doesn't imply probability close to one. 
No, it does not now imply that the, automatically. So now that uh, in the case when for the independent set that you knew that there oh, was yeah, a yeah. threshold. Right, right, you're right. For independent set, you, you, you actually know that. But the, the reason we did more work is because it's a good question. Also, you even know, you even know more because you know the fluctuations root n by a very classical and simple Dubs martingale argument. The reason we have to do more work here is we want to pin down the, the precise, uh, the, the really the sharp fluctuation. We show that the, constant, the, the okay. fluctuation of this size of uh, largest independent set is only order one. That cannot be given in the soft, uh, by a soft argument. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, that's but why but if, you, if you just wanted to know the sharp threshold, if you, if you just wanted to know the value of the threshold, is the argument substantially simpler? Then you just uh, need to, the, then, uh, then up to the point when you show the second moment uh, is bounded by the first moment square you are done. Then you can maybe okay. Okay. save, I, don't, I can't remember exactly, maybe 15 to 20 pages, I can't remember exactly. Yeah, it's simpler. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Good. Thanks. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. Thank you. So, so one more question, maybe. Can you tell us how you define the clusters sure. in the not all equal three set case? Is this kind of similar to the independent set? Yes, uh, it's it's similar. So you look at a variable. If you if the variable, no matter you set this variable to be one or zero, uh, uh, the 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 it's still uh, the clause is still satisfied. You set it to be free. Th that makes sense. Okay. Yes. Okay. But they, and... but they also would have a chain effect, right? Now you look at the variable. If you set one variable to be free, uh, okay. And uh, and if in uh, look at the different clauses, uh, if the if that if that variable is not forced by other clauses, then you can also set that variable to be free. Oh, I see. You, it's so, like sort of the same chain effect, but there's a slight, slight difference. I see. Okay, I see. If if kind of after. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I have to think about it. Yeah, I think it's, this is probably best to to just look at what we have, what we defined. Okay, yes. I mean, if you have basically in the end, you have to satisfy the following: any rigid things, basically, you cannot change it. If you change it, the the it it will be wrong, and also it will mm -hmm. right. That means it, it it's a forced. Then, if it's a free, then it cannot be forced by any of the clauses. Okay. But if your clause has two frees, then it cannot force any other variable because this freeze, these two frees can co collaborate together and actually satisfy the clause. Something like that. I see. Uh, John, was, uh, yes. one more thing. So, um, sure. the order one concentration is, is extremely strong, and I guess you, you cannot expect this to hold also in the case of uh, Erdogan, right? There, I think square root n is the best you can hope for, right? Uh, Right. I, I okay. But the intuition is that you know you can in the right degree, trendy, yes. Right. Like you you can imagine yeah. taking any configuration, adding like throwing in extra square root and edges, and it's kind of the right. same probability right. under right. the trendy. And I, I haven't really done the calculation, but I believe that that would be the, should be the case. The the graph has this kind of fluctuation. Yeah, it's not. I agree. It's not. It's not as obvious as I uh, implied, but yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I would I, I would tend to agree yeah. with you. That's a sentence I learned from my collaborators. <laughs> we can agree that I don't really have a strong support, but it sounds very intuitive, yeah. yes. So, do we have any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks again. You, should, you can turn off the... Uh, uh, I, I still didn't say anyone, so maybe now I can turn off my slides. <laughs> and I... Yeah. But I think we just had... Uh, <laughs> I so, see. Yeah, we, we can go. So I guess we can go offline. So